I had kidney disease for almost 20 years and it started to bring me down, but I was an adamantly going to avoid dialysis at all costs. I was overcome with responsibilities. I was taking care of my 93-year-old mom who has dementia. I had my grandchildren. I, I didn't have the luxury of being able to let go. So I said, okay, just do the dialysis and long enough for me to get things in order and I'll be done. So I did. And then I started to feel better. And the really neat thing is that as I've been on Next Stage and been doing my treatments at home, I have an endless bounds of energy that I never had before. In the clinic, I had made it clear I would learn everything myself. I wanted it that way. I'm a very independent person, fiercely independent. I feel that it's important that you own your own treatment. People say, well, I don't know how to pull a needle out. Well, there's lots of different methods and whatever works you know, for your dexterity, it's not difficult. It's something that can easily be learned and you can do it yourself. You don't have to have someone to pull that needle out. I learned that my treatments were for me. I really didn't like having anybody around and I also found that I didn't make as many mistakes. My, my labs have been great. I'm a very stable patient. So they agreed to sign off and let me do my treatments alone. Believe it or not, I know that sounds crazy, but once I get in there and I'm on and you know everything's all running smoothly, it's really relaxing. <laughs> I'm Milcha Gedney. I'm an next stage patient. everybody. My routine for home dialysis compared to in center is basically I could get up, I could have breakfast at my leisure, and then I could start my treatment whenever I want. I was diagnosed with kidney disease about um, 2005. The nephrologist was trying to put it in remission didn't work out and then my husband passed away you know i was mourning and dealing with the children and then a year after his death 2008 i found out that i had kidney cancer as well as end-stage renal failure and then i needed dialysis so this is tableau her name is tammy before my transplant, I was using Next Stage. Well, the difference uh, between the, the two is that the Tableau is how easy it is to use. You know, you just go, set it up, and you're on your way. 10 steps compared to like 20 or 30. After being prescribed in-center dialysis, a routine that led to constant exhaustion and restrictions, Jimmy Bates became aware of a new option. We're looking at, you know, what's going to give him the best quality of life. Yeah. So we know this machine is gentler on his heart than the ones in center. We also know that slowing down the blood flow rate on this machine also is even better on his heart and his fistula. Um, we also slowed down his UF rate, so it gets a deeper cleaning, deeper into those molecules, so his body doesn't even feel like he's a dialysis patient. Right. Home hemodialysis allows Jimmy, with the care of his wife Dawn, to travel across the country, showing firsthand how you can have kidney disease but still live life to the fullest. They do a type of dialysis that it's relatively new in the sense of this particular machine and this particular method, which provides a freedom to our patients that they've never had before. That's one of the things we lose, because when people crash into dialysis, even when they know that they're going to start dialysis, all of a sudden you're told what you can't eat, what you can't drink, you know, what time you have to be at the center, how long you have to be here, and it's, it's very regimented, and so they lose time traveling to the center, their time in the center, traveling home, and then the rest of the day for recovery. You know, we don't have that. You know, wherever we go, we're home. That's right. Having this at-home option has given Jimmy his life back. It's like the outside of the camper says, it says spend your day your way. That's what we want to do. I have to do dialysis, but once that's done, I can go and do anything else. 
know, and there, you know, there are people who are afraid, and I understand that, you know, there are, change is scary, and you're already thrown into this world that is scary enough, you've been told you have a disease that has no cure, you know, and so now people are talking to you about putting needles in yourself and doing your treatments, and that's very scary, but it doesn't have to be, it can be very empowering. The Bates say it is important to be educated on all options that are available. I was a new mom. I had just gotten married. I just moved into my home with my family and I got this diagnosis with kidney disease and it threw everything out of whack. I didn't really know much about dialysis. I really didn't know much about kidney failure. I personally thought it was some kind of terminal illness. It was very frightening to me. Once I had to start on hemodialysis and I was going to the center, well, it was very depressing. The first thing that we're told as patients is what we can't do, what we can't eat, where we can't go. Well, what was the conversation that you had with the doctor? Well, I said, well, I asked him, uh, what if I don't want to do this? What if I don't, what if I don't want to do dialysis? He says, well, then you have between a few days and a few weeks to live. I think that, that being able to do it at home has been the best thing in the world for me. It gave me the freedom and the flexibility to continue doing the things that I love. I've had the opportunity to continue things in life that I would have had issues with trying to continue and going in center. Once I got over my fear of self cannulating after that, there was nothing that could stop me. Our favorite story is that we have dialyzed in a tent, running off a generator at a motorcycle rally surrounded by 10,000 people. It was awesome. I'm a mover and a shaker. I have to be able to get up and go when I get ready. You're not tied to a regimented schedule of, of a center, of a dialysis center or of a hospital. Nocturnal treatments have made a huge difference in my quality of life. At first it seems very overwhelming, but don't give up, just keep on going and you will establish a routine and it'll just become automatic like a reflex and you don't even have to really think about it. The real convenience of doing it at home is there's no travel time. Liz is here for the whole four hours. And we're talking and planning and, uh, about things. You feel like you have control over your life and you can plan and make other things work. We can look at our calendars and we can say, well, this is what the week looks and we kind of plan it out one week at a time. And we have free time. Let's drive up and go to San Francisco today. Let's drive over to the coast for a day or even spend the night. You can work it so that you have a pretty good gap in there. Oh, it's great. No, I feel like I have kind of reclaimed my life a, a little bit. Uh, there was a stretch there. I couldn't walk very far, couldn't play golf. I've played twice this week. When I first heard about it, uh, I thought, well, here's something to hope for. Here's something that could improve my life and could make it better for me. And it's turned out to be true. I am a self-appointed queen of dialysis. I like to rule my dialysis machine. Um, I went into kidney failure when I was 14 years old, which is 19 years ago now. Um, and I can't have a kidney transplant. So I live and survive by dialyzing myself on this beautiful, huge dialysis machine um, pretty much every night at home overnight while I sleep, carefully supervised by Archie the cat. Um, in my previous talk, I'm not going to obviously cover it again, but I talked about the fact that for many dialysis patients, kidney disease is really, really tough. When your kidneys fail, it isn't just that your body can no longer clean the blood and actually remove toxins to keep, you know, the kidneys keep you alive, but it's not just that. 
Um, your kidneys interact with all the systems and all the organs in your body, so they affect your bones, they affect your brain, your memory, your concentration, they affect your digestion, they affect your joints, they massively affect your energy. So people with kidney disease are chronically fatigued, and, and yet they don't look ill. And that's one of the challenges, and actually when I spoke at the original TED conference, I talked about how lucky I am to do my dialysis at home and to be able to do six or seven hours every night as compared to the people who have to go to hospital, and they can only do four hours three times a week. So that's having some level of kidney function for four hours three times a week. The rest of the time, their body is just accumulating toxins and they just feel awful. But they don't look ill and it's really quite challenging for them to sort of try and survive and function and get on with everyday life when they're managing with this really tough disease. And one of the things that for me came out of doing the last TED Talk was that that was the first time I went onto a really public, quite high profile platform and shared my story of doing home dialysis and how lucky I am and what a great experience I have of dialyzing in that way. And it put me in touch with a lot of kidney patients all around the world, in fact, who found the talk and contacted me and shared their stories. And it was very humbling and very inspiring to hear from different people who are all managing with this disease. And you are always a kidney patient. So we all hear about the organ donation list and everybody appealing for people to become donors. But even if you have a kidney transplant, it doesn't fix everything. Hopefully it will be great and you will do really well, but that transplant probably won't last forever. And you will be taking an awful lot of very aggressive, strong medication to keep the transplant working. So even when you have a transplant, it's not a solution. So kidney patients, they're a tough crowd. They're um, really strong, really positive people. Um, and they're dealing with a lot. And actually, it's also a fairly hidden disease, but it's more common than you think. So probably most people here or maybe you yourselves may have some degree of kidney disease and may have some awareness of this. So my, my last talk was really enlightening for me when I thought, actually, I am so passionate about spreading the message about kidney awareness and about home dialysis, and I want to help more patients to feel empowered to care for themselves. Home dialysis is fairly scary as a thought, as you can see, it's a complicated machine. Your blood is in the machine going around um, a pump all night. You've got needles in your arm. You do feel, you know, that's fairly vulnerable. There are lots of things that you feel could go wrong. So for a lot of patients, home dialysis is a fairly daunting prospect. And a lot of them aren't even offered the choice for various reasons. Their unit or their hospital just don't offer them that opportunity. Eric and I met in high school and we have been married for 33 sure. years <laughs> and we have two kids that we adopted, um, Antonia and Jacob. So we love traveling and uh, hiking and camping. We love to be outdoors. So I was 16 and I got gout and they did blood work and also looked at my urine. The blood test showed that I had uh, about 50% of my kidney function. And for the next 20 years, I would visit a nephrologist annually and I would give blood work and we would monitor it and things were going quite well. And then the blood tests showed that my kidneys started to fail. And um, within four months, they went to end-stage kidney disease. And I started doing emergency dialysis. While he was going through the emergency dialysis, I was very involved um, taking him to appointments, sitting with him during dialysis. It was pretty scary and um, a lot of crying and a lot of, of worry. And so uh, it was just asking for a lot of help and relying on those around me to um, give me some support. For anybody anybody having whatever medical issues and i'm talking about the care person you have to be very supportive you have to be there whether they're giving you a hard time or they're giving you an easy time you need to be be part of the support some advice that i would give to other care partners would be to not be scared to understand the benefits that this is going to have for your loved one. They might already feel like a bother. They already might feel like, oh, I don't want to get my family involved, but just doing little things like sitting with them and you don't really have to say much. You just have to sit with them and let your presence be felt and um, just be positive and try to be that anchor for them when they need you the most. And if they want to come home, I think we have to lose that fear of what can happen because at the end of the day, like I said, 
we're sharing that time with them and we're learning along with them. Home dialysis has absolutely changed um, our lives together and Reggie's life. And the, just the, having the convenience of having it here, that he doesn't have to pack up and go into the car and leave and go somewhere to get dialysis. I remember getting up for school and sometimes like, you know, she kind of helped me with day-to-day -day things because she's so tired or she just came back from um, being in center and coming off dialysis. So she had to sleep and things like that. But this time around seeing my mom so energized, she's doing everything for her church. She's running around doing errands, making me dinner every night, just simple things like that. It, um, it's a little difference, but it's huge. It's more of an energy that he gets after he's done doing treatment. And it gives him the freedom to set up at the time that he can. When he was going in the clinic, he was going in the evening, so he will come home drained. After she started doing home dialysis, I realized just a change in spirit. I strongly believe like people hear fa heal faster when they're like amongst family and like those that they love. <laughs> Um, I'm doing music the whole time since college, high school. I've always been in music, so I'm recording and just trying to get a career, trying to be this rapper, trying to do all this stuff. And I'm just starting dialysis. And you know, three, four months later, I ended up going on tour, and we did all 40 cities. I treated it in every hotel, and uh, we completed the, the tour. And I'm talking to an hour spots on, on stage, like right after treatment. After uh, getting my transplant and the kidney failing, I had to go back on dialysis. Going back home was my decision because I was so used to doing home, and I wanted that freedom. Um, we're, we're tight knit. We can be in the house and be in the same room um, a lot of the times. My kid wants to be. Daddy's always home, and I think that's important for them. Kind of like a safety thing for them. So in the morning, I usually just take time to be thankful for just getting up. You know, no matter how I feel, no matter if I'm tired or if I'm hurting, I'm just happy to get up because I know I got another shot. Some people don't get that, you know, some people didn't make it today. When's only sound yours truly, David Rush, man. Thank you all for joining with me. I'm, I'm a program up. director for a radio station. I do consulting for other artists as well. So there's really just a lot of music stuff that I knock out on the days that I don't have dialysis. My mornings usually get a lot done in that day. I'm feeding them all through the process because they're always hungry. So I'm either getting snacks and getting lunches ready and, you know, just making sure they're taken care of, they need help. He's a special kind of person. I don't even know how to describe him. He's just a special person. He makes this situation, his health situation with our regular routine, normal life, kids in school, very easy. If you always wanted the best dad in the world, then he's right here. You know, I'm blessed to be able to do this stuff. And there's people who can't put their own pants on in the morning who have to do dialysis. And, but then there's people who have full careers and do dialysis, you know. So I think it's all based on your willpower, your mental status of where you are, and your support system. Hello. You know what? Some of you may have seen me earlier, Nel Chagetney, and I'm the director, executive director of Home Dialyzers United. And I'm here today with a really special group of <clears throat> advocates that I want to introduce you to in no particular order. First up is Dawn Edwards, who is a self-described chronic kidney disease warrior with firsthand experience of every renal replacement modality, including transplant and rejection. So Dawn, welcome, and we're looking forward to chatting with you. Next is Tracy of Bailey Amati, who is a patient advocate, a former in-center and home dialysis patient, and two-time transplant recipient, who actually just got her second transplant this year. Um, and finally, Erin Battle is a wellness ambassador for the Roganson Institute, New York City, and is helping patients to get their wings back. Erin um, also is an actor and singer in New York City, and welcome everyone. 
Um, we're yes, here yes. to talk about what we wish we knew when we started. We've all been on dialysis for a fairly good length of time. I know I'm in nine years, um, and each of you have a, a fair number of uh, years under your belt. So let's just start going around, maybe start with Dawn and uh, then Tracy and then Aaron, just uh, again, in no particular order. And let me tell us about what you wish you had done differently when you first found out you had kidney disease. Wow. You know, I could talk all day about what I wish I knew uh, when I first found out I had kidney disease. When I found out that uh, I needed dialysis, it was way back in 1992. And there just weren't any resources readily available for me to educate myself, to find out what dialysis was like, what this new life was going to be like, and what I could expect. So I learned a lot by fire. Um, I wish that I knew that home therapies was going to be um, as great as I found out it to be later on. Uh, I wish that I knew more about diet and how that was so important in prolonging the kidney function that I did have. You know, in addition to that, I really, really wish that I knew patients that were doing dialysis um, just like me, that I could talk to and ask them the questions that I just couldn't get the answers from, from the clinical staff in the dialysis unit. So that's just a couple of things, but I could go on and on. And Tracy, how about you? I agree with Dawn. Um, the most important thing that I wish I knew, like Dawn said, how nutrition is very, very important. Um, during my five years, I lost a lot of weight and when you're on dialysis, you lose your appetite. Food doesn't taste the same. And I wish somebody told me that not eating is not an option, that you have to use food. You have to look at food like medicine. When a doctor tells you you have to take X, Y, and Z, that's exactly what you're going to do. So food is very, very important. I wish I asked a lot of questions. I wish that I did have other dialysis patients to bounce off questions and looking at seeing dialysis in the works. I knew of dialysis, but I really didn't understand the machine or actually see it being done. And Aaron, how, how, what was your uh, experience like? Um, I just wanna say, I wish I knew. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> because you know you're into this whole situation all of a sudden and you don't know anything and like um don um i started when i started a while ago and when i i had time actually to understand what was going on but i didn't have the resources um i had two and a half years before i actually started to have treatment and um, but I was also lucky enough to find a facility at that time that was doing a home treatment of peritoneal dialysis because it wasn't actually that readily available at that time. And I just think that um, from now, all of the information and education that happens was not happening at that point. I'm sure some things were out there, but it was not available. And it's not available to new patients who have, have absolutely no idea about what what this illness is and what it does and how you need to take care of yourself uh, with food, et cetera, et cetera. So I can definitely resonate with your comments about food. I, um, I actually was able to help avoid going on dialysis for almost 20 years by doing a low protein diet, uh, avoiding moving to a more natural diet. Um, and lately I've been working with um, uh, the plant diet based diet. So I, Food is very important. And as Tracy brings up the, you know, you have to think of it as medicine. Uh, but moving on, what do you think are some questions that you want the audience to know that were important to ask uh, as you started? Um, Dawn? 
Yeah, one of the first questions that's really important to ask is when you find out that you're in renal failure, if you're not one of those patients that has to start dialysis right away, one of the questions to ask is, what can I do to prolong the kidney function that I already have? And that's where we go back to that food. Um, Again, that's one of the most important um, aspects of prolonging the function that you have. The next question that's really important to ask is, what are my options? You don't have to accept what's offered to you first. Um, You know, one of the things that I really regret is that I went in center first without finding out more about what my options are. So those are like the two main questions that you really need to ask Um, when you find out that you have kidney disease. And the next thing I would ask is, is there a patient or someone that I can speak to just like me who's gone through this journey that I can talk to about what to expect um, as I go forward uh, managing kidney disease? And Tracy, do you have some questions that you uh, can think of? Um. I think it's important to know what caused your um, kidney failure, number one. Um, I didn't know that there were five stages of kidney um, disease. So I think it's important for you to know, um, like Dawn said, that what can I do to slow down the progression of the kidney disease. Is there medication that I can take? I know with the, um, at the time that I was experiencing kidney disease, the doctor gave me Prograf, but it didn't work. But there may have been other medications out there and I didn't even have the mind to even ask because of the fact that I allow my emotions to get in the way. And I think that it's important for you to not to see dialysis as um, an end, but it's a new beginning and you just have to learn to accept where you are. And I believe Christine in the first session, she says that don't try to get back the life that you had but you accept what you are, your situation that you're in and start a new beginning. Wonderful advice. And Aaron. Um, Again, I love the simple answers. Um, What, what, what do I ask? I mean, basically that's really the question. Um, We're very fortunate right now to have so much information and so many resources available to us now. Um, As I said, when I started, I knew there were some things going on. When I live in New York City, you would think that there would have been more. There was nothing. Um, it was uh, it was more for me to actually find out. I was lucky enough, as I said, to have um, those years and also had a great nephrologist. And they actually let me go into a dialysis facility um, before I was ready. And all I could say was, I don't know, I can't do this. I cannot do this. There's no way in the world I'll ever be able to do this. And then I, again, as I said, they had peritoneal dialysis and most facilities at that time that I know of did not ha- have that option. And I said, what is that? Can I do that? And I started on peritoneal before I actually had, I mean, I think I had a couple of sessions in, um, in Denver, but I was training for my PD. Um, what, do, what do you ask? What, what does this mean? Um, am I going to die? Um, I mean, I think Dory earlier was talking about fear and um, we're working on something about that as well. And the fact that you can't remember anything when you're scared, you're absolutely frightened because all you hear is, is that even if they're not saying it, is that I'm going to die. You know, Aaron, this is everything you're saying, everyone, everybody said is exactly true. I remember early on uh, being sent to the dialysis clinics and literally being overcome with fear. Mm-hmm. I, I call it my PTSD moment. Mm-hmm. So, and nobody ever discussed with me that there were options for home. Um, and this was only 10 years ago. So even knowing what those questions are to ask um, is really important. 
Um, we had a question from the audience, and it seems to me this is a really hot topic today. Um, and they want to know about um, it, 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 how challenging is it for a patient to learn to cannulate themselves for home dialysis? So I know, Dawn, you've done this in the past. Anyone else here? I have as well. And how was yeah. it for you, Tracy? You know what? I I didn't have fear of um, learning to cannulate because I knew that that's going to get me home and I'll be able to do dialysis at home. I would have more freedom. Um, my children and my two daughters were seven and nine at the time. So I was able to be home for them. So fear with the cannulation was not an option. And that the nurse that I had, because I started off with Next Stage for about five months, um, she was very good and just um, being with me every step of the way. And I just built my confidence and then I was able to do it myself. Wonderful. And Dawn, how about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of similar to um, Tracy, but uh, when I was presented with uh, cannulation, I was a little bit nervous, but one of the things that I always did when I was in the dialysis center was I looked at everything. Um, I watched them put my needles in. I watched them put my need take my needles out. I looked at them put other people's needles in. And so I wasn't afraid of the process in and of itself. I was a little bit apprehensive as to whether I was going to do something wrong. And what I learned that is really valuable, and I want all of the patients that are listening to today that are afraid of cannulation is home training nurses are the best. Um, my nurse spent time with me. We started by me taking, her teaching me how to take my needles out. And then she did the guided technique with me where I put my hand over her hand and she put the needles in so that I could feel how the um, cannulation technique actually felt. And I was paying attention to how I felt inside my body, like how the needle felt when it went in and when you felt the pop when it goes into the graph mm -hmm. or when you get that flashback. I really paid attention to those things. So after I held her hand, then when I felt comfortable, then she put her hand over mine and I started to put my own needles in and I was paying attention to how it felt and if it didn't feel good, then we could draw back and make that adjustment. That's something that when a technician or a nurse in a dialysis center can't do because they can't feel inside of you. Mm -hmm. Only you can feel that. Mm -hmm. And once I got that first flashback into uh, from putting my needle in, that was it for me. Mm -hmm. I was empowered. I was ready to go and I was excited about being able to cannulate myself on my own. You know, I experienced everything that you two have talked about um, it, and it is so empowering. And to this day, no one will ever put another needle in my fistula. Absolutely uh, so not. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, you think you can't do it. I still actually have to look away if they draw blood but I can, you know, put my needles in every day. So we have another interesting question, which we're actually going to talk about a little later today. Um, but Debbie Lawson writes about uh, uh, AKI as a uh, initiating for your uh, the cause of your kidney to failure, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a, a part a topic really important to me because. I, in looking back in retrospect, that is probably what has had precipitated my uh, starting dialysis as well. Did any of you experience an AKI or that you know of, or was did you have a, um, a genetic you know, illness or another reason for starting diabetes? One of the, uh, I think it's interesting to tell the audience here um, some of the many different reasons that we've all ended up in dialysis. Um, for me, I had FSGS. 
Okay. And it was very progressive. And it, um, I tanked very quickly. Um, I crashed into dialysis because I experienced my, my husband passed away. I was supposed to go for some testing to see exactly where I was. Then I crashed into dialysis. I found out that I had kidney cancer and um, end stage renal failure. So it's very important that when you get the notice that you have kidney disease based on a disease like FSGS, you have high blood pressure and diabetes, you need to really take care of yourself, do your follow-ups, do your testing, and just um, be aware of where you are in your illness so that possibly you can prevent going into, crashing into dialysis. And uh, Aaron? Um, I, I didn't, you know, and I think again, it was one of those things, how do you, how do you ask the questions when you don't know? And as, because I, I um, certainly had time, but I didn't have a follow-up. No one ever said to me, we actually need to do a biopsy. I never had any, I didn't, I'm not di a diabetic and I, I didn't have high blood pressure until they found out I was in stage four. And it was just really one day I went to um, a, a, a physical for a job and um, my pressure was high and they're, I'm, I'm looking crazy and they're, they're yelling at me and telling me, why do you do this? Have you done this? Have you done, do you drink eat too much salt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm trying to explain to them, I've never had high blood pressure. So luckily, my no, my doctor was part of the hospital system, and I went to see him immediately. And he said the same thing. You've never had high blood pressure. I'm not sure what they're, what's going on, what's happening. And I went to see him, and he took uh, pressure in one arm, the next arm, and in my leg. And he was going the whole time going, oh, oh. Huh. You know, that whole thing where it's like, what has happened here that I missed, to be quite honest. And he actually apologized to me. But there was nothing that we missed. It was immediate. And we had, had absolutely, no, absolutely no idea why it happened. And I did not get a, a biopsy or to even find out what happened. It's not in my family. So we still don't know. So, and I'm 14 years transplanted now. So, great. And Dawn? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question because there are so many different ways that you can um, develop kidney disease. I personally didn't experience um, AKI or acute kidney injury. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really important. Um, when I was a toddler, I had scarlet fever and that's a staph infection. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't corrected. I, I took medication for it to clear up the staph infection, but it was never followed up. And I had throat infections as a kid and as a teenager, I had urinary tract infections and we just kept taking antibiotics and antibiotics. And by the time I was 22 and I gave birth to my daughter, that's when they discovered that I was going into the stages of, of late stages of kidney failure. So it's not just diabetes, it's not just hypertension. Um, it's, it's not just acute kidney injury or, or genetic diseases, but it's things that you would never think of, like taking too much ibuprofen or having um, recurrent infections like I did. So, you know, you, there's nobody to blame. It's just life and it is what it is. <laughs> So um, actually, there's a follow-up question to that. And um, someone has said, uh, have you ever heard of uh, kidneys that come back after AKI? And if you'll give me a minute to just to talk about this, it's very, you know, a subject dear to my heart. It has happened. It is very rare. Um, there are things that you can do, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon in the uh, session about right dialysis right at the right choice, right time. Uh, but just to be brief, uh, you want to protect your kidney function at all costs. And so even if you do need to start dialysis and you have residual function, you need to try to protect that. The best way to do that is doing home dialysis, doing a very slow and um, gentle treatment, figuring out as you are learning, and, and I did this for myself, was how much dialysis 
how much pee, just to be very blunt. And you find a balance, sometimes too much dialysis and you pee less, you know, you want to pee more. So that's one way to help protect your kidney function. Again, there's no promise that that's going to happen. It's very rare, um, but it has happened. Sometimes it can be permanent. Sometimes it can go for years that you have recovered your function. And other times it can only last for a few months. Um, but again, something to discuss with your doctors. Um, Another very interesting question is Ellen, who asks, "What? Do, how do you need to know when you it's time to go on dialysis?" And I, we've probably all been there in a different uh, time. So, Dawn, take it away. Yeah, you know what? That's something that you can only know when you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, I was told that I would um, be going on dialysis soon. I got my fistula put in, and they you know, they told me to just wait and you'll, you'll know when it's time to go on dialysis. And my feet started swelling and I pushed it until the last possible minute. It, I got to the point where my lungs were filling up with fluid and I couldn't lay down to go to sleep. And I was like, okay, I guess it's time now. So everybody's experience is different, but um, you'll know when you know. And Tracy? <laughs> Yes, the first time, like I said, that I crashed into dialysis, I was, um, then I received a transplant. I was dialysis free for seven years. Then I received, um, I had a gallbladder, um, I'm sorry, a bowel obstruction, and um, that, and knocked out my, um, my re remaining uh, kidney function. But before that time, I knew that from what the doctor said that my function was decreasing. And he said, I'm going to wait for you because you are going to know with the swelling of the feet. And I knew from the first time that my kidney was failing, um, how I felt, I was wheezing, so I knew and I just wish that I could have prolonged it a little bit more. But with the um, bowel obstruction, I had no other choice. And then I had to do dialysis the first time. I mean, the second time. And Aaron, how about you? Um, I you know, really, it was very interesting. I'm a, a kind of a weird person with symptoms. Um, and my uh, my numbers just kept going up. I didn't always feel bad. I didn't feel, I, I really didn't feel bad. I didn't have any trouble breathing. I've always been a thin person, but then I didn't have any swelling. I still was urinating, but it was probably more water than it was anything else. So I didn't have a lot of those issues, but it was numbers that actually ended up getting me on dialysis. Um, and I still had a little more function once I started, which um, if I had been able to start on um, peritoneal and if home hema was available, I probably would still have more function um, through, throughout the whole process. But um, that's when I knew. That's when I found, I knew because they said you have to do it now because it's already, your numbers are still crazy. But I, you know, basically what, what ended up happening. So I totally understand. Um, this question. I Over the 20 years, I would see a nephrologist and twice I said, if you don't start dialysis in a year, you'll be dead. Um, and I, I still felt great. So I was like, I don't quite understand. In fact, the second time that happened in 2007, I packed up and moved to Ecuador for a year. So, you know, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> well, I also did what I'm going to tell you not to do. And I put my head in the sand. I literally absolutely refused to look at anything related to dialysis. So it's hard to believe here I am today, but when I crashed into dialysis, I knew nothing about it, except that when I did drive to the nephrologist, I had already packed a bag. He said, do you wanna to go to the emergency room now or in Monday? And I said, now. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know when you know, and yeah. that was it. And so, but again, I did manage to nurse myself along for about 20 very productive years. Um, so that, with that being said, um, we might want to just summarize. We're coming to the end of our time, and it's just been wonderful. You know I love you all. Um, so maybe some words of advice for people that, that are looking down you know, the same journey that we are on. Uh, just summarize in a few quick sentences something you want to tell them. Anything. Just get as much information as you can. There is a lot of information out there. 
Um, also, um, talk to, as everyone said here, talk to a patient who's dealing with and had and or has has dealt with kidney disease. They know uh, whether they know they know, but they know just through their experience is exactly what happens and what's going on. Um, you know, and you know you can then uh, weed out some of the myths and some of the misconceptions, but also just try and learn what is happening to you and take care of your bodies. And Tracy, yes. Yes, I say don't look at dialysis, whatever form, whatever options you have decided to take, don't look at don't look at it as a death sentence. You can live a very good life with dialysis. You just have to take care of yourself. It's a frame of mind as well. You got to take each day as uh, as it comes, if you can't do something, you can't go anywhere, just relax because tomorrow's another day. Yeah, and I would just say um, th the number one thing, and I say this to people that live in underserved communities who are often marginalized and kind of pushed into one option because that's what's convenient. Don't accept the first thing that you're given. Find out more information, mm -hmm. um, learn as much as you can, ask different people different questions about different things, educate yourself, become empowered, and never, ever, ever give up hope, and never be afraid to go from one thing to another. Life mm -hmm. is all about change, and you just got to move and shake right along with it. That's true. Um, one thing about this journey that we know is that change is inevitable. Um, you're going to go through different uh, treatments during your lifetime on dialysis. You'll have um, different prescriptions. Uh, and just when you think you've got everything under control, something right. changes. Yep. <laughs> and, and so mm -hmm. if it's taught me anything, it's to learn to roll with the punches, um, you know, yeah. just grin and bear it. Um, you know, there was one last question that we didn't really touch on in the last minute or two we have left, and that is, do you all use a care, have a care partner with you um, during your dialysis at home? I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> um, I do nocturnal my treatments now, so um, my mom is in the house with me, right. and she doesn't do not one thing. <laughs> um, I do everything myself. She's just there. Um, when I did PD, I, I did everything myself as well. I didn't need any help there. And when I first started on home hemodialysis, I was very sick coming back from a transplant. So I did need some help then. But once I started doing those treatments and I started to feel better, I was like, ah, I don't need you anymore. And I was able to do it myself. <laughs> and <Tracy? laughs> Yes, my daughter, she um, she was in the next room because she was working from home, but I did everything myself unless, you know, if I needed like, you know, something to drink, Naomi, come in. <laughs> and um, it was a very good experience compared to in center. And I just want to share, I did receive a transplant February of uh, this year. So I'm doing really well, and I just want to, you know, support people who are on their journey of making whatever decisions that they make. So again, thank you all for sharing your your stories with the audience, and I'm hoping that we've given them a little bit of reassurance that you know we can all live our best lives, no matter what cards mm -hmm. we've been dealt. Um, so learn what you can. Uh, from all of the resources. And one of the great things about this event today is that along with every session that you're attending, underneath the, uh, the, the pictures, if you scroll down, are a ton of resources. Um, and on the websites of the organizations partnering here today, you'll find even more resources. And so that's how you are gonna learn. You know, just soak it up like a sponge. Mm -hmm. Learn as much as you can. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, what an amazing session. It's always such a one it's such a wonder to hear from our patients. Like we learn so much about, you know, what they go through and what they're looking for. Um right now though, I am currently sitting with Dr. Rachel Perlman, who is a nephrologist at the University of Michigan. She is passionate about helping people with kidney disease 
successfully use home dialysis therapies. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Perlman. Thanks, John. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here to discuss health equity issues in home dialysis. So going to, so I'm going to start with a, our first question, which is how would you describe the current state of access to home dialysis across the country? Thanks, John. That's a really important question. Um, and I think it's important to note that people who are from uh, populations who are sometimes called underserved, but specifically African-American, Native American, and Latino populations are overrepresented in kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease requiring dialysis, but tend to have less access to and less use of home dialysis. Um, home dialysis is not spread equitably across this country and is certainly used more both in some um, regions and in some um, micro regions or dialysis units. And so not every dialysis unit in the country is, um, is able to provide home dialysis or has the certification to provide home dialysis. So where you get your dialysis care can really impact the kind of dialysis that you do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, so my next question kind of, you know, falls, um, goes along with that. Is it harder for certain racial or ethnic groups to access home dialysis? And if so, which groups and why? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So people who are um, African American, Native American and Latino are underrepresented in home dialysis. And usually when I say home dialysis, I'm lumping together home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, with peritoneal dialysis being much more common than home hemodialysis. Um, and access to both of them is really important for everybody who, um, who has kidney failure requiring dialysis. And um, what, what I hear from my patients and what I read in the medical literature is that people who do dialysis at home really value that opportunity um, and both the health benefits that come with it and the ability to have that control over their medical care and their lifestyle and make dialysis fit in better. And so having access to home dialysis is really important for everybody. In terms of the barriers and what keeps people from being able to access that, I think it exists on very many levels. And so one is that um, in order to do dialysis at home, you need to be um, educated about home dialysis. And I don't mean educated like formal school education, but if you don't learn that home dialysis is a possibility for you and what it takes to do it, you're not going to engage in it or, or be able to move forward with it. And so ideally, dialysis education starts before people actually need dialysis, but it doesn't need to end there. And so if you start with hemodialysis in a dialysis center, you absolutely still have the possibility to transition to uh, home dialysis the big but is you have to know that it's available to you and you have to be getting care somewhere that offers it. There's also, a, a um, in addition to that health structure piece, um, I think it's really important that as kidney disease education is provided um, to folks looking towards dialysis or her on dialysis, that um, home dialysis is offered to everybody so that provider biases don't lead to a, a pre-selection of patients who would be somehow considered um, better for or more appropriate for home therapy, but that everybody is considered as a potential candidate for home therapy. Um, and then another piece that I think is really important is that when people are doing dialysis at home, they tend to be um, advocates for it and both want to tell other people about it, but are, are comfortable talking about it. And so most people or many people with kidney disease know somebody else with kidney disease and may even know somebody else who's getting dialysis. 
But whether they know somebody who's doing dialysis at home, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, can make a really big difference in whether doing dialysis at home feels accessible. Because doing home dialysis can feel scary and weird and cut off from medical care, which I don't think it is. Um, but knowing from a, a peer or a, a, um, a, somebody that you know who's doing it can make it feel so much more accessible than just hearing it from your nurse or doctor or social worker. I 100% agree. And that leads me to my next question. What can be done to bridge the gap for racial and ethnic minorities who might not be getting full access um, about all their dialysis options? Yeah, that's such an important question. And uh, there probably isn't one answer, but lots of pieces to the answer. And so one, um, Health systems need to make care equity, equitably available to all, but, but saying that doesn't make it happen. And so the availability of education from what is, is now much more common, but has not been as much of the traditional medical education like online resources and learning from um, members of a dialysis community, I think is becoming much more important. Um, in the past decade, uh, home dialysis use has really increased significantly um, across all uh, populations, but um, folks from underserved populations continue to be underserved in home dialysis. Um, I do think that as the, as the population grows and we develop a better infrastructure for dialysis, it becomes dialysis at home. It becomes um, easier to make it available to more people. Um, Again, that doesn't mean that it's going to be made available equitably to all people. I think it's important that um, training of nephrology physicians and nephrology nurses includes home dialysis. Part of that training starts with how we reach out to patients and consider um, most everybody a candidate for dialysis at home instead of it being more restrictive with barriers to get there. Um, and we need doctors and nurses who can provide home dialysis in all communities. And so as it is now, uh, dialysis centers that serve a, a larger number of people who come to dialysis with Medicaid are providing less home dialysis. And so that's a, an infrastructure problem that needs to be solved, mm -hmm. a medical infrastructure problem, a reimbursement problem. Well, Dr. Perlman, thank you so much for joining us. It has definitely been an informative session. And for anyone who would like to leave any questions for Dr. Perlman, please just put, leave them in the main stage. Um, we now are going to be transitioning to our second breakout, which includes three sessions for you to choose from. One is um, on home hemodialysis, the second being peritoneal dialysis, and then one is understanding your options. We hope you find these sessions and are, you know, and choose the one that best accommodates what you're looking for. But thank you for joining us and have a good day.